What's up, Ewu crew? The Raven is back again to share another interesting, shocking, or just strange, but very true story with you. Today, we're going to explore three stories of victims and the chilling photographs they last appeared in. In 2015, 18-year-old Cheyenne Rose Antoine and her best friend, Brittany Gargle, did something that many young girls do, something they didn't think twice about. They took a selfie, a picture that would later come back to haunt one of them. The picture shows the friends posing together, Cheyenne grinning and holding the phone, and Brittany smirking with a hand on her hip. They posted the picture to Facebook and went on a night out. The story goes that the two ended up hopping between bars in downtown Saskatoon. At some point during the night, Brittany apparently met a man. Brittany uh -oh. and this man hit it off, getting along so well that she decided to leave with him. Uh -oh. Sometime after Brittany and Cheyenne had parted ways, Cheyenne decided to use social media to get back in contact with her friend. She made a post on Facebook asking her where she had gone. Where are you, Brittany? Haven't heard from you. Hope you make it home safe, and I need my phone. Love ya. She never received a reply. This is the case- Wait. So she had her phone with her? So your friend had your phone, and she was with a guy. Why would she leave? First of all, why would you leave your friend behind to go with a guy? Better get his number and keep pushing. It's his first twist, but I could never have predicted the outcome. In the early hours of the next morning, a driver was going down the Dark Valley Road near the Saskatoon landfill on the southern outskirts of the city when he noticed something peculiar on the side of the road. Something about the shape turned his stomach, so he pulled his car over and got out. As he approached, he realized that it was the body of a young woman. Uh -uh. She was lying on her back without any shoes. Worrying that the girl may be injured, the man checked for any signs of life. Oh, no. But horribly, he found she was cold to the touch and mm. she wasn't breathing. When he saw her neck and the markings there, he realized that she was dead and had probably been strangled. Mm. The man, of course, called the police and an investigation was launched to find the identity of the young woman. Lucky for the police, she had distinctive tattoos and they released pictures to the public in a bid to match a name to the disturbing corpse. A woman came forward and said she was worried that the body belonged to her friend. Mm -mm. It was determined to be Brittany Gargle. Oh, wow. Investigators started to put the clues together to understand what happened to her. They utilized the girl's social media and everything seemed to point to the mysterious man who Brittany had left the bar with. But that isn't what actually happened at all. No, the real story is much, much darker. Here's where it gets crazy. Investigators go to interview Cheyenne, after all she was Brittany's best friend, and presumably one of the last people to see her alive. She worriedly tells the police, yeah, we got ready together that night and then went to the bar and then a house party. And then last we went to Colonial Pub and Grill. That's where Brittany asked some dude for a lighter and kind of invited him to tag along with us. But after that, I got dropped off at the lighthouse. It's an assisted living shelter because I wanted to visit my uncle and I never saw Brittany again after that. Her story sounded credible enough and Cheyenne was pretty forthcoming, even putting her uncle on the phone with police to corroborate her version of the events pretty much everything checked out. But still, the investigators did their due diligence and sought to tie up this loose end by double-checking Cheyenne's timeline with the surveillance footage taken at the pub. She so you think, so y'all think her friend had something to do with it? Like, come on now. She left with a dude. She went to the bar with her friend and she left her friend to go with a dude. You don't think that's crazy? And you think a friend has something to do with it? I understand if she was the only, okay, I understand she was the last person that was seen with her, but still, if she telling you that she left with a dude, you know what I'm saying? She said they last visited. 
And that's when they saw something that made their blood run cold. Or rather, it's what they didn't see. They couldn't find any trace of either Brittany or Cheyenne at the establishment. Investigators were taken aback. Could the sweet teenage girl they'd just spoken with really know more than she was letting on? Hmm. They checked the security footage from the lighthouse shelter. Cheyenne and her uncle had never met up that night either. Oh, wow. She Suddenly, lied? they started to doubt Cheyenne's story, and this suspicion marked the beginning of a two-year investigation to untangle the complicated events of that dark night. It was the innocent she selfie lied? that the two took and posted only six hours before the discovery of Brittany's death that finally broke the case and was the key to unraveling the truth. When Brittany's body was discovered, something had been nearby, but at the time, no one thought too much about it. It was a black belt, a belt that was later believed to be the weapon used to strangle her. And that distinctive belt, braided and thick, was awfully familiar. No that same way. belt was the one in the photo the girls had taken at the beginning of the night no. and was worn by Cheyenne. I took another look at the picture because at first, I couldn't remember the belt. No way. You mean to tell me that girl murdered that girl? But for what though? But there it is, in the very corner of the photo. No so, way. what actually happened that night? Well, unfortunately, it still doesn't totally make sense to this day. The friends spent the evening drinking, and for the most part, they had a good time, but this didn't last. At some point during the night, the alcohol the two had been consuming stopped encouraging their laughter and instead fueled a heated argument. Brittany never met a man and left with him. The Facebook post Cheyenne she had made to Brittany that night was an attempt to cover her tracks, and she used social media to create a web of lies that kept investigators looking for a different suspect. Oh, wow. Ultimately, it was a tip to the police from a witness who claimed Cheyenne confessed to the unthinkable. Reportedly, she had shown up at the witness's house and hysterically confessed to how she had hurt her friend, hitting and strangling her. But what kind of what? argument could lead someone to kill their best friend? Right. We don't know. Cheyenne says she doesn't remember strangling Brittany, but she doesn't dispute that she killed her. Cheyenne was initially charged with the second degree murder of her best friend, Brittany Gargle. Oh, wow. But at the trial in 2018, she pleaded guilty to a charge of manslaughter and was sentenced to seven years behind bars. Looking at the picture, I find it so eerie to see Brittany smiling happily after having just helped her friend decide to wear the weapon that would be used to kill her. Mm. The next last photo we are exploring is one that captures a moment mm. of delight That's as an crazy. adventure is about to take place, but has now become a haunting reminder of a life cut too short. 30-year-old Swedish freelance journalist Kim Isabel Fredrika Wall had a promising career ahead of her and by 2017 had already accomplished publishings in Time, The Guardian, and The New York Times and had even won awards for her reports. One of Kim's upcoming okay. career endeavors was to interview the Danish inventor and entrepreneur Peter Madsen. In early 2017, she had requested an interview with him, but Madsen didn't agree until August. As a bit of an eccentric, Madsen invited Kim to interview him alone on his homemade submarine UC-3 Nautilus. Kim agreed, but only planned to be there for two hours, as she and her boyfriend were throwing a going-away party to celebrate their planned move to Beijing later that month. Beijing. On August 10th, Kim boarded the submarine, and this photo was taken. In it, Kim smiles, standing with her upper body above the submarine's tower hatch. At her side, looking over his shoulder, is Peter Madsen. Kim was apparently afraid to go into the submarine, according to her boyfriend, but despite her reservations, she went anyway, as she was fascinated by people dedicated to something. Kim's boyfriend became concerned when Kim never arrived at their party. Uh -oh. He went in search and reported Kim as missing, but then uh -oh. Madsen was found. The morning after Kim had come to interview him, he was rescued from his submarine after it foundered. Despite being aboard a sinking submarine and nearly trapped within, Matson was discovered to be calm and serious and unshaken by the frightening events. But there was no sign of Kim. Initially, Matson claimed that he had dropped Kim off after her interview concluded, 
But as you will see, that wasn't the case at all. Something about the damage to the submarine was suspicious to the authorities, who saved Madsen, and they soon suspected that he had intentionally scuttled the ship. But why would Madsen destroy his own submarine? Right. And where was Kim Wall? The ship was eventually raised up, and there was no evidence of Kim on board. Yet Matson's calm demeanor and matter-of-fact recounting of the night's events was unnerving. When researching, I found quite a few different accounts of that night, and it turns out Matson gave multiple different stories, none of which added up. This is probably why he came under suspicion in the first place. You know what I think? <clears throat> I think he killed that. I think he killed her on the submarine and tried to sink his submarine so then her body would go down in the water with the submarine. That's crazy. Along with the fact that the submarine never docked after Kim boarded. So no matter what he said, nothing could explain how Kim could be safe if the submarine never came back to land until after it had foundered. Because of this, Madsen was swiftly arrested after his rescue. Initially, he was charged with negligent manslaughter as police suspected Kim's fate had been an unfortunate accident. So they found her body? And at first, Matson changed his story again to match this assumption. But soon, more evidence washed ashore. Gruesome and horrifying her evidence. Body? Eleven days after Kim's disappearance, a cyclist was enjoying a bike ride along a beach in the southwest of Amar. The wind was whipping up off the water, but the sea breeze was pleasant. Among the rocky shore, the cyclists noticed something peculiar, and they slowed down, coming to a full stop near the misshapen lump that they just couldn't quite identify. Nearing it, the cyclists realized, with horror and the knowledge that they would never be able to forget what they were seeing, that it was part of a woman's body, her torso beheaded and without limbs, and bearing the marks of stab wounds congregated around the groin. Her? Body parts just kept washing Bruh. up on the shore and at first no one was sure who the body belonged to. In order to end the horror of a beach laden with body parts, cadaver dogs and police divers what were brought the in. They found Kim Wall's head in a plastic bag. Oh Madsen maintained that Kim's God. death had been an accident, though he soon admitted that he had... Oh my God. How can he... How, why, how would a person do that? Why would you even... Oh my goodness. He dismantled her. Been the one to dismember and dispose of her body in the sea. Here's where the story gets crazy. Madsen's explanation was that while he had been up on the deck, the air pressure within the submarine suddenly dropped and caused toxic fumes to fill the air supply, killing Kim. The problem is, the medical examiner can't determine the exact cause of death because Kim's body had been exposed to water for so long and decomposed. However, the coroner testified that they were doubtful that Kim's death was caused by carbon monoxide poisoning, though it was possible, but thought it was more likely strangulation, a cut to her throat, or drowning. What the medical examiner did know for certain was that Kim's body had sustained more than 14 wounds and cuts. But Madsen had an explanation. He claimed he slashed her body to prevent the buildup of gases that occurs when a person dies. That way she would sink to the seabed. He also admitted that he dismembered her because he couldn't lift her body off the submarine otherwise. Get the heck out well, of here. it didn't make sense to the judge. Don't Madsen was sense. found guilty of premeditated murder. That still don't give you the right to just chop up somebody, chop up the body of somebody. Okay, if they died of the carbon dioxide or whatever, don't mean you gotta mess with the body. Just leave it like it is. Aggravated assault and desecrating a corpse and sentenced to life in prison. Ooh, I can't help but wonder what Kim was thinking oh, when that chilling last photo of her was taken. Did she have any idea of the horror that was waiting for her in that submarine? The final disturbing last photo we're taking a look at today might be the most chilling of them all, and in fact has frequently earned the title of the most terrifying photograph. 
In 1990, 14-year-old Regina K. Walters and her boyfriend, Ricky Lee Jones, were standing alongside a highway, hoping to hitchhike a ride. The two young teens had just run away from their homes in Pasadena and thought that their luck had turned when a truck pulled Why over to offer them a ride. The driver was Robert Ben Rhodes, Ooh. a man who at this point is believed to have had a long criminal career and had already Ooh, killed a couple in a situation eerily similar to the one that Regina and Ricky found themselves in. Of course, they had no idea that Robert, who seemed trustworthy and was kind enough to offer them a ride, was plotting to make them his next victims. Oh, Lord. Almost as soon as Regina and Ricky climbed into Robert's truck, everything went wrong. Robert killed Ricky before quickly disposing of his body in a methodical and cold manner. But of course it was methodical. Robert ostensibly had a lot of practice at this point. Robert had already done this exact calculated routine on his previous victims, Patricia Candace Walsh and her husband Douglas Zakowski, a few months prior. He felt sure of himself as he held Regina captive in the truck. It is reported that he continually assaulted her in a variety of ways and even cut off all of her long curly brown hair. Robert would occasionally call Regina's father on a payphone taunting him and telling him about how he had cut off all of his daughter's hair. This time, uh. Robert forced Regina to stay with him longer than his other victims, probably because he had been able to get away with it up to this point, and didn't worry he'd be caught. It's unknown exactly how long he kept Regina captive, nor the extent of the horrors that the young girl faced. I tried to narrow down an exact timeline, but unfortunately, the only piece of evidence that gives any indication are photographs that Robert took of Regina. These pictures show her hair growing back and multiple bruises, all in different stages of healing. Mm. With this in mind, it's a safe guess to say he held her hostage for months. Mm -mm. Among the photos Robert had taken was one that is haunting, to say the least. It shows Regina in an abandoned farmhouse wearing a black dress and heels what that Robert the? had forced her to put on. He then calmly took photos of her one of which shows that her hair is cropped short and her dress is unbuttoned. Regina's face expresses so much in one photo, absolute fear and sadness, but also a hint of defiance in the way she frowns. She holds her arms out in front of her in defense. The longer I look at the picture, the more I could see everything that must have been going through her mind. This is the last photo of Regina alive, and Robert behind the camera oh, was the last thing she ever saw. After the photo was taken, Robert picked up bailing wire and strangled Regina. <gasps> As a testament no. to his state of mind and the coldness with which he treated Regina, after she was dead, he simply left her body on the floor of the barn where it began to decompose. Robert later earned the infamous name of the truck stop killer, and though Regina was his last victim, she was allegedly just one of many. Purportedly, Robert was arrested when another woman he had kidnapped screamed until she was found in Robert's truck by a trooper. Robert was convicted of Regina K. Walter's death and two others. He was given life without parole. Mm. Robert is suspected of assaulting Ooh. and killing up to 50 women between the years of 1975 oh. and 1990. To this day, Robert sits in Maynard Correctional Center in Chester, Illinois. Yeah. Bring it right back. Yeah, you can write in there too. You're gonna write in that prison. That's crazy.